All right. Well, welcome everyone to Boulder County's Virtual Senior Law Day 2020. Um, my name is Brett Landis. I'm one of your co-chairs. I have just a few announcements before I introduce our speaker today, uh, who's talking about guardianships and conservatorships. Um, so due to some things are just, just a little different, probably like every other aspect of life. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded. Uh, this is one of the benefits of doing this virtually, and the video will be available later on our website. Um, so if there's something that you don't remember exactly, or something that you just want to refresh your brain on, or if you have a friend who wasn't able to make it, uh, we've been posting those, or we will be posting those uh, about a week or two after the talk, and you can always access them on our website. We have muted all of our participants. Please remain on mute unless the speaker invites you to unmute yourself. Uh, we do also have the ability to have you type your questions into the chat during the presentation. So if something comes up and you have a question, please feel free to type it in there. Uh, the speaker may not get to questions until the end of the webinar. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, smoke in the air. Sm uh, the smoke in the air is definitely getting to me. Um, but uh, yeah, please feel free to ask ask questions in that chat. Um, I'm sure I'm sure many of you will have them. We have a few more web webinars coming up uh, for the remainder of September and the first of October. They are every Tuesday and Thursday from noon to one. We also still have scheduled a bonus session on uh, following the estate planning webinar on October 1st. Uh, so you can sign up for any of the upcoming ones on www.bouldercountyseniorlawday.org. Our next one coming up this coming Tuesday is on uh, fiduciaries. So if anyone has ever granted you power of attorney, um, that is going to be an excellent one to go to to figure out what does that actually mean <laughs> and what are what does your job entail um, one downside of this year's uh, senior law day is we are not able to offer our usual ask a lawyer program however our platinum net level sponsor the boulder county bar association does provide a free virtual legal clinic uh, applicants are going to be paired up with attorneys who can give them a brief legal consult on a variety of issues. Uh, so to sign up, uh, please feel free to call the Boulder Bar Association 303-440-4758 or you can apply online at their website. Uh, it's really pretty obvious when you first go there at the top of the page www.boulder-bar Dot org. And we have Senior Law Day handbooks. For anyone who's attended the event in person, the handbook is that wonderful book full of lots of information that you get at the end of the day. Right now, they are available online at seniorlawhandbook.org. You can actually download it or just go back to the website when you want to refer it to it. Um, it's a really great, easy way to access that handbook wherever you are. We do have a few copies that are going to be available uh, in the paper copy version. To access one of those, please contact Erica Corson at the Boulder County Area Agency on Aging. Her number is 303-441-1170. So if you need any of that, please let us know. Um, and finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors. Without them, this event would not be possible in virtual or in real life. Um, and I am just so excited right now because I get to introduce our speaker who's gonna be talking to us about guardianships and conservatorships. Our speaker today is Brandon Fields. He is an attorney in private practice in Boulder, Colorado, specializing in elder law estate planning, probate, protective proceedings, and long-term care and special needs planning. He is, he is a jack of all, all trades when it comes to elder law, and we are very, very lucky to get to 
to hear from him today, Mr. Fields is an active member of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys and the Elder Law Section of the Colorado Bar Association. And he is on top of that, additionally, a regular speaker for the Alzheimer's Association. Um, very knowledgeable, we are so excited to hear from him. Mr. Fields is a graduate from Brandeis University and the National Law Center at George Washington University. So many thanks for, for speaking today. I will stop my screen share and turn it over to you, Brandon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Just get my program going here. Okay. So <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to talk about uh, guardianship and conservatorship in the time of COVID-19. Uh, my name is Brandon Fields. I'm an elder law attorney in practice in uh, Boulder, Colorado, as uh, Brett mentioned. Um, so we first start out talking about who might need a guardian or a conservator. And, you know, uh, stereotypically, we might think of someone who's in the hospital, hopefully in better care than this uh, this person here with the Marx Brothers. Um, and sometimes I have done guardianships and conservatorships for people who are in the hospital, um, particularly uh, brain injuries, um, where someone is in a car accident and suddenly cannot uh, take care of themselves or their affairs. So let's talk about who needs a guardian or a conservator. Um, so a guardian, um, when you uh, file for a guardianship, the person who the guardianship is for is initially called a respondent. Uh, if a guardian is appointed for someone, then the person is called a ward. Um, it's different than, uh, you might have heard the term a ward of the state, that's different, that's really more for a minor who doesn't have uh, parents taking care of them. This is just a ward overseen by a court. Um, so to need a guardian, uh, the person has to be found by the court to be, a, the defined term is an incapacitated person. So in a summary fashion, we would say that's someone who cannot make decisions for their personal or healthcare. Uh, personal, we're thinking of, for example, where does the person live or do they need to relocate uh, in the case of a senior to an assisted living or a uh, skilled nursing facility or a memory care, um, possibly from their home or from one type of facility to another and the guardian would have the ability to make those decisions for a person. In the case of a conservator, uh, the person also is initially called a respondent, but if there is a conservator appointed, then they're referred to as a protected person. Uh, that is a person who cannot make decisions for property or finances. So we have two separate types of fiduciaries that can be appointed by the court the guardian, healthcare and personal decisions, or the conservator, property or finance decisions. And a person can have both or just one or the other. Okay, so let's talk about how you start a proceeding uh, under COVID-19. Um, so we have, um, an online system for filing cases in Colorado, um, which is mandatory for attorneys to use. And we file through a system, it's called ISIS, uh, which means Integrated Court, uh, Colorado Court E-Filing System. Um, an individual without an attorney generally must file in a clerk's office. So you do a paper filing and you go to the clerk's office. Um, so eight counties in Colorado have started some online uh, filings 
for pro se parties without an attorney, but so far those are not for guardianship and conservatorship as far as I know. Um, so you would have to go to court. Um, so during the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, we had a period in particularly in March and April where the courts were not hearing regular guardianships and conservatorships, only emergencies. Um, that's since changed and you can now have a regular guardianship or conservatorship proceeding started with the court. And some of the court clerk's offices are only open for limited hours. So that doesn't affect us if we're filing electronically, but it would affect someone if you're filing without a lawyer uh, by going to the clerk's office. So it would be advisable to call the clerk first and make sure when the office is open. Okay, so to start a proceeding, you have to have a service of process. Um, so service of process, you might uh, be familiar with the term uh, process server. And the idea is that it's an independent person who serves the papers on the respondent so that they know there is a proceeding that's going to start. They know what it's about and they know when the court hearing is to be held. Um, in this particular case, you cannot waive the service of process if you are the respondent. Um, even if the respondent has an attorney, the attorney cannot accept service for the person. The person has to be personally served, and that's because um, guardianship and conservatorships take away many of the rights of a person to make their own decisions. So the system has this safeguard to try to make sure the person is aware that this is taking place. So it includes a notice and a petition. Um, this uh, graphic here is a bit of a joke. Um, this fellow has been served with process and uh, has mistaken it for a publisher clearinghouse award, which is not what we associate with the process service. Um, here is a sample of a notice of hearing. Um, this one is in blank. So it would be filled out. It would say which court this is taking place in. It would have the name of the respondent. It would have the name of the attorney for the person who is petitioning. Um, if there is attorney, if there's no attorney, then it would have the name of the petitioner there. And then you can see it goes on to say when the petition, when the uh, case is being heard, when there's the next hearing. Um, let me see, I've got some question here. Okay. Ah, that's a good question. Um, okay. Um, how does, uh, the question is, let me read this. How is process service piece working with long-term residents currently given the restrictions on people entering long-term care? And um, so uh, what that's addressing is, you know, we typically use a, a process server who's a professional, a person who goes and basically what process server is, they hand the papers to the person and they sign uh, an affidavit for the court saying they have given the person the notice and the petition. Um, in my experience so far, we have been able to do process service on people who are in uh, facilities. They make an exception. Uh, you have to follow the COVID uh, procedures, wear a mask, have uh, social distancing, and, um, and they can make service. Um, I'm sure that many of the facilities have restrictions and some of them, I'm sure when they're faced with this issue for the first time, they have to figure out how to handle it because they're trying to let as few people into the um, facility as possible. Um, so that's an issue we might see on a ad hoc kind of case by case basis. Um, okay. Um, 
So here you can also see uh, you're telling the person whether this is a petition for appointment of a guardian or a conservator or both. You check those boxes um, and whether it's for an adult or a minor. Here we're only addressing issues with adults. Um, and then there's a notice at the bottom which is telling the person how important this type of proceeding is because this can take away your rights to make decisions. Um, also, it points out that as far as the respondent goes, uh, who's normally the senior here, um, you are required to show up um, unless the court excuses you for a good reason. Um, and of course, this is changed somewhat in the time of COVID. And then we'll get to that a little bit later in terms of people actually showing up in court. Um, so for uh, guardianship and conservatorship, uh, it's generally the practice to attach a physician's letter or an evaluation done by um, a psychologist uh, dealing with the person's capacity to make decisions. So that's the issue we're looking at primarily. Do you, does the person have a capacity to make decisions for healthcare? Um, do they have capacity to make, to handle their finances and their um, property? Um, so generally when I ask for a physician to provide a letter, um, we will say, please give us the person's diagnoses and then talk about how that affects their decision-making capability. Now there was a Colorado Court of Appeals case in 2015 where a um, father contested an appointment that was made after petition by his son because he said that there was no medical testimony to support a conservator. Um, in this particular case, um, as we see in some of these cases where the issue is uh, financial exploitation, he had sent almost $500,000 of his money to what turned out to be scam offshore accounts. Um, so he was being manipulated and exploited by someone. Um, and it was kind of a complex case in terms of medical evaluations. He was ordered to do an evaluation and didn't do it. Um, and the court decided there was enough evidence to show he couldn't manage his finances and appointed a conservator. Um, and the issue on appeal was whether there had to be medical testimony um, to make that appointment. And the court said that for a conservatorship, you could, a uh, judge could make an appointment without medical testimony. So without medical testimony, we're looking at we as, what we as attorneys would call facts and circumstances. So um, some other examples I can think of, of cases I've had, you know, I have had people who've been um, subject of exploitation, um, some of the ones we typically see are people who are contacted and told they've won a sweepstakes. Often the sweepstakes is supposedly in a foreign country and they're asked to send money to pay the taxes on their purported winnings uh, before they can receive money and they start sending money. And typically, even if they send some money, they're then asked to send additional money and it's kind of a terrible cycle of financial exploitation. And um, I have had both cases where we've had medical evidence and some where we, especially when it's um, an emergency type situation and they're dissipating all their assets, sometimes we've had appointments without uh, specific medical evidence. Um, now, it's, it would be harder to make a showing of facts and circumstance for a guardianship, um, but not impossible. In the guardianship context, you know, as we started to talk about, you've got to have a finding of incapacity. So that is even more of a medical-oriented finding than just that a person can't manage their finances or property. Um, so... 
it's possible, but it's, it's not typically done without medical evidence. Um, sometimes we do have a case where a person doesn't cooperate. Um, and in those cases, um, you know, in terms of providing medical information or access to records, in those cases, sometimes the petitioner can subpoena records, medical records, or the statute provides that the judge can order an evaluation of a person to try to find out what the level of capacity is. Okay, so the next step in the court process is a court visitor. So this is a person who is uh, appointed by a judge, uh, a disinterested person uh, with some training as is required by the court. Many of these people are social workers and the court does provide court visitor training. Um, their role is to interview the respondent and to see and report back to the court on whether they understand the proceedings, if they want to object to the proceedings. Um, they have a form that they follow with a series of questions that they're required to ask, and then they fill in the reports, I'm sorry, the answers in the report and file it with the court. Um, so here, for example, the visitor asked the respondent if they want their own attorney. Um, if so, the court will generally appoint an attorney. Um, and that's regardless of whether the person can afford one. If they can afford one, if they have assets, generally they will have to pay for the attorney that's appointed. If they uh, meet the definition of indigency, meaning they can't afford counsel, then the state of Colorado will pay for uh, an attorney for them. And sometimes it's not clear whether they have assets or not, and their attorney will have to file an affidavit uh, from someone with the court showing whether they meet the definition of indigent. Um, the court visitor is generally also required to go to the person's home to see about their conditions um, for health and safety in the home. Now, we've run into some problems with that, with the COVID. Um, I have one case in which a person would not allow uh, the visitor into the home and they did the best they could by looking through the windows and doors and uh, that was satisfactory in that particular case. Um, sometimes we have, um, especially in the cases of moderate to severe dementia, we have issues of paranoia in which even if the, we didn't have COVID, the person might not want to let people into their home. So in all those cases, the visitors do the best they can and can file some explanation with the court as to what they are seeing. Um, they will typically interview other parties over the phone. So for example, the petitioner and other siblings uh, of the petitioner, if the petitioner is an adult child um, or a spouse, if there is a spouse for the respondent. The visitor is also um, required to say whether they have recommendations on whether there should be appointment of a guardian and conservator. Um, the judge is not required to follow those recommendations. He or she can make their own findings, but judges tend to look at those as an independent look at what is happening in the case. Um, and sometimes uh, we refer to the visitor as an the eyes and ears of the court um, for that reason. Okay, so let's talk about specifically the finding to appoint a guardian. So as I mentioned, this is the highest standard. This is a higher standard than uh, the conservatorship. Okay, and um, yeah, I'll let, I've got another question that I'll, address. It's another good good question, I think. Um, so you can see that incapacitated person. So let's take a look at this definition. This is the wording out of the statute. So it means an individual other than a minor, because we're dealing with adult guardianship, who is unable to effectively receive or evaluate information or both, or make or communicate decisions to such an extent that the individual lacks the ability to satisfy essential requirements 
for physical health, safety, or self-care, even with appropriate and reasonably available technological assistance. So we're looking at two aspects of communication, right? Can they take in the information and understand it? And then can they process that information and communicate a decision um, which gives them the ability to satisfy requirements for their own physical health, safety, and self-care. Um, and can they do so even with appropriate, reasonably available technological assistance, which is a separate term. So um, one uh, question I received that I'll address because it fits in with this. So you're, you know, we're thinking, who could make such a determination? So the gold standard for capacity is what we call a neuropsychologist. They are a type of clinical psychologist that does testing. Um, they have expertise in testing. Um, and you may have seen there are a whole bunch of different cognitive tests that they can do. Um, I have seen cases where they spend uh, two separate days with a person, series of hours of tests and report the results of those tests and make determinations about capacity. Um, in some cases, uh, they, they will typically also do um, uh, a review of the person's medical history, get their medical records um, and review those. And so in some cases, people are not capable of doing all the testing and they will report what, they're, what they are capable of doing and what that means for their determination. Um, now the statute actually is broader than that and would permit uh, any physician, a nurse or a social worker to provide um, a letter for the uh, court and the judge would have to make a determination based on the level of expertise of that person and the, what they're articulating in their evaluation um, as to whether it's enough for the judge to make a decision. Um, there are, you know, as the question points out, there are various levels of practitioners, even within uh, non um, psychologists. So there are psychiatrists, there are neurologists, there are geriatricians. All of those have a lot of experience working with seniors. They don't do uh, per se psychological testing. They may do screening tests, um, as do the social workers and the nurses. Um, some of the co most common screening tests for dementia you may have heard of the um, slums test or the MMSE test. And those are just screening tests and they go on a scale. And based on the scale, they will give you some insight as to whether the person likely has a cognitive impairment, mild dementia, moderate dementia, or severe dementia. But they are not determinative. Um, they're not determinative, but they can be considered as factors um, the judge can uh, also rely on the experience of the physician. If, a, for example, we have lots of cases where a family uh, physician or general practice physician or an internal medicine doc will give a letter. And one of the things they might have that a psychologist or psychiatrist might not have is they may have treated the person for a series of years and they might see the change in the person over time. For example, I recently had a case where a person um, had received several MMSE tests and had gone from scores in the 20s down to a score of a nine. And, you know, that is indicative that their cognitive skills were declining. And that was a factor that was used. It was not the factor, but it was a factor. Um, in making a determination on capacity. Um, so let's look a little further here. Uh, what would it take to make a finding for a conservator? 
Okay, so this is not at guardian, this is just for a conservator. And here again, we've got the statutory language. Respondent is unable to manage property and business affairs because the in individual is unable to effectively receive or evaluate information or both, or to make or communicate decisions, even with the use of appropriate and reasonably available technological assistance. And then we've got another unusual aspect, which uh, I haven't had this come up, but or because the individual is missing, detained, or unable to return to the United States. So you could see how that last piece would be particularly um, of concern with regard to someone who's missing or detained um, or is abroad and can't come back and has property uh, that might dissipate um, or be wasted. Um, but in most cases, we're again dealing with the two aspects of communication. Can the person take in the information and can they receive it and evaluate it? So for example, in this context, we know that in cognitive impairment and dementia, in most cases, one of the earliest skills to go is the ability to deal with numbers. And so it's not unusual to find a person who might still be able to uh, make healthcare decisions, but even of their own accord has ceased managing their finances. Um, and I know from my own experience, for example, uh, my mother suffered from uh, Alzheimer's uh, dementia. And at some point, my siblings and I discovered that she was just taking her uh, monthly bills and sticking them in a drawer and not opening the envelopes. And the reason was really because she couldn't follow what the bills were saying and she couldn't process the numbers and see whether the bills were um, owing or overdue. And so she, um, and she was a college graduate and she, I think, had some loss of pride in that, which is not uncommon, and therefore was just um, telling people that all the bills were paid and it turned out they were not. And um, so she was unable to process the information at that point. And even though she could communicate decisions, her processing um, had gone. So the decisions she could communicate were no longer valid or appropriate. And even though she wasn't aware of it herself. Um, so that's an example. Um, Let's talk about technological assistance. Um, this is, I don't know if any of you have seen one of these recently, this is a Rube Goldberg uh, machine. Um, this one is for self-operating a napkin. <laughs> um, but seriously, when we talk about technological assistance, you know, we're talking about, particularly with seniors, um, things that affect uh, processing. So we typically have, you know, vision, hearing and speech. Um, so here are some simple examples. A person who needs glasses or um, a magnifying reader. I worked with a client who had uh, macular degeneration and could actually read their bills, not with glasses, but with a machine, which would do a very large blow up uh, of the bills and could pay their bills. But without the machine, uh, she could not. Um, so really the question is not could she sit in a room and just be presented with a bill and pay it, but could she, with the use of her machine, uh, do that? Um, so those two are for vision. Um, we do find it's not unusual to find people who um, do not follow through on their medical appointments. So they might have a prescription for glasses that's years old and just is not sufficient anymore. Um, and of course, we have the two types of macular degeneration, which affect vision, um, the dry and the wet. And sometimes the people are in denial about those conditions and they really can't see enough to manage their finances. But in that case, you know, assistance might even be a person um, reading them their bills and helping them. 
helping them pay them. So communications board or a picture book. So these would be for um, people with speech issues. Um, a common uh, one we see in uh, seniors is uh, aphasia, difficulty, I'm sorry, let me go back to that, difficulty in uh, communicating. So the use of a communications board um, or a picture book where they can point to things sometimes can be helpful in articulating decisions with a person with aphasia. Um, so also the, the last item, a laptop or a tablet, such as an iPad, um, people who have communications uh, difficulties sometimes can type and use a laptop um, or a, a touch screen on a uh, tablet. Um, hearing aids, a major issue. Um, again, many people have hearing loss um, and some people either through pride or self-neglect have not gotten hearing aids or have ones that are old or in dementia. Sometimes I have had a number of clients over the years who don't change the batteries. Um, and obviously if a hearing aid has uh, used up batteries, it's not going to work. And so we try to give people in the law the benefit of the doubt that they get the technological assistance they need and then determine if they uh, need a guardian or a conservator. Um, okay, so let's talk about a court hearing during COVID-19. Um, so uh, there are different types of court hearings. Um, my experience is primarily in this guardianship and conservatorship area and in the counties around where I practice, so Boulder, Broomfield, um, Jefferson, Arapahoe, and Adams. Um, so two types of hearings during COVID-19. In-person hearing, where people use masks and social distancing. Um, and then online hearings where the entire hearing is done by a video conference technology. Um, the one that I have seen the Colorado courts using is called WebEx. Um, and it's very similar to Zoom, which we're on today. Um, so I did, I have participated in only one hearing in person with masks and social distancing. Um, it has quite a few challenges. As you can appreciate, it's difficult um, for attorneys who are used to um, approaching witnesses to ask questions, to social distance. Sometimes you need to hand exhibits to people who are witnesses or participants. Um, again, difficulty with social distancing. Um, masks, difficult to hear someone speaking who is participating uh, through a mask if they're a witness or a, um, or a principal, a respondent or petitioner. Um, you can have a mix. Um, I have had hearings where there's a mix where it's an in-person hearing and yet some of the witnesses are allowed to participate by video, in which case they're not wearing a mask and it's easier to hear them. Um, Okay, and what about emergency situations in the case of uh, guardianships and conservatorships during COVID? Um, so we do have two types of emergency appointments in, under the Colorado statutes. Um, we have what's called an emergency guardianship. And under the statute, that is only supposed to be for an emergency situation and the appointment is for up to 60 days. So um, what that means is the court will make an appointment, but they will also set a hearing on whether there needs to be a permanent guardian or a conservator, and that hearing needs to take place within 60 days. Um, sometimes the emergency does resolve itself within that period, and so the permanent hearing doesn't take place and the emergency guardianship will just expire. Um, when it's set, 
when the emergency guardian is set, it is done by a court order and the order will say whether it is for a full 60 days or sometimes it's to a day uh, certain on which the hearing is to take place. Um, I have had a few, particularly again, going back to the case of a brain injury where a person is initially not conscious or minimally conscious and then they, within the 60 days, they do, they're not completely recovered, but they are recovered enough so that the physicians feel they don't need a guardian to make healthcare decisions. And so the emergency guardianship is allowed to lapse and they just take over their own healthcare. Um, so what about conservatorship, finances and property in an emergency situation? Um, so that's called a special conservator. It's not called an emergency, um, even though it is the equivalent of an emergency guardian. Um, since it's less of a deprivation of rights than a guardianship, um, the statute's more flexible. Um, the court can set a time for hearing um, the permanent conservatorship and it doesn't, it's not limited to 60 days. So courts will sometimes go longer for a conservatorship proceeding uh, than for a permanent guardian. Um, if you're petitioning for both, the court will typically try to do the hearings together and have a hearing on guardianship and conservatorship, but it's not required. They can separate those um, or even hold one hearing, make a determination. Sometimes um, in the case of a medical emergency, the courts will appoint an emergency guardian to help with healthcare decision-making but feel like access to the person's money and the facts around that could wait for the permanent hearing because it's got to take place within 60 days anyway. Um, and sometimes we do have um, some issues with the judges in which the lawyers or the petitioner without a lawyer tries to make a case that there is a need for an emergency and the judge will say, well, I see the reason you want a hearing for a guardian or a conservator, but I don't see the emergency. And therefore, I'm not going to make an emergency appointment and you will just have to cope with the situation um, until the permanent hearing. Um, so some examples of emergencies are personal safety. Um, we see those a lot of times when someone is in a home situation that's unsafe. Um, I've seen hoarding situations where there's fire hazard. Um, sometimes the, um, those are initiated by the um, Adult Protective Services, Social Services Agency for the county. Um, even where the county is initiating a proceeding, um, the preference of the county and really all state governments is to have a family member step up and be the guardian or a conservator if there is a family member that can do it. Um, sometimes they will step in and be an emergency guardian to remove the person from their home and place them somewhere and then try to get a family member to step in. Um, for emergency decision making, um, we see those typically where there's a decision that has to be made about surgery um, or some kind of medical procedure that can't wait and the person can't make a determination on their own. Um, one interesting thing there is Colorado does have what's called a healthcare proxy statute. So if a person um, has a medical power of attorney, you know, their agent under that power of attorney would typically be able to make a decision. Even if they don't have an agent, there is a healthcare proxy statute that allows a hospital or physician to rely on someone who is a close family member or friend. Um, the, the idea is that the hospital would generally look to the people who are, they're able to contact who are close to them. And if all those people are in agreement that if there is one person who could make a decision 
just for purposes of this limited medical uh, and safety issue, um, then the hospital can rely on that person as a proxy. If there's disagreement amongst those people, or they can't find any of those people, then typically you would need an emergency guardian. Um, okay, and then for conservatorship, typically an emergency type of situation is a wasting asset, um, something that you know would go bad if it's not taken care of, like a person who owns a, a factory and the, the goods are uh, stored on a temporary basis and would go bad if they're not moved, but there's nobody to take charge of them. Um, financial exploitation is a type of um, emergency. Someone like in the cases I've talked about with the sweepstakes, um, where they're continuously writing checks, sometimes the court will wanna step in and just stop that at least temporarily till the court can decide whether there's a more permanent um, need. Um, we, I have had um, emergency conservators sometimes on a showing that someone's been trying to get a person to sign a deed, to deed their house away. Um, sadly, those are often uh, cases where it's a caregiver or purported caregiver who's trying to take advantage of an elderly person and get um, their assets. Okay, um, one interesting wrinkle here, um, and just so everyone knows, you can, if you wanna pass questions, um, you can do through, through the chat feature. I have had a couple of those questions and I'm trying to answer them as we go along. Um, okay, so here's a new law that was just signed in 2020, and um, so we don't know much how, about how this is gonna work, but I can, kind of briefly uh, review it, because um, it's interesting. Um, we hadn't talked about this, but in both the emergency situations, the emergency guardian or the special conservator, because of the emergency nature of it, the court is permitted to make those appointments even without notice to the respondent. So if someone's in an unsafe situation, the court can step in and appoint someone temporarily, or if they're being exploited, um, even without the notice, um, which notice means, you know, serving the papers on the person and the personal service. And uh, typically under the statute, the, the service for permanent guardianship or conservatorship actually has to take place uh, at least 14 days prior to the hearing date. Here, um, the emergency guardianship or conservatorship might be held the same week the petition is filed. Um, and we have had some issues, particularly with, uh, with the kind of uh, misuse uh, of, of this by someone who really doesn't want to alert the senior who might object or another sibling who might contest. And you can see that part of what happens is that it gives, uh, it can be perceived as giving somewhat of an advantage when there's a battle among siblings as to who should be the conservator or the guardian, that one has already been appointed on an emergency basis and they will get access to more information on that emergency uh, appointment and so they have somewhat of an advantage. Also, uh, what this statute in particular is looking at is the fact that you have people, um, and this is the first time we've had this in the statute, who may not have close family, but have what uh, is called a supportive community or supportive community members, who are people in the community, friends uh, or other professionals who are helping them make decisions. So contrary to what someone might say, even though the person has been isolated from family members, maybe they have other people who are helping them and, um, and therefore really do have ability to make decisions and family members who don't, who don't like those people or don't uh, think they should be the ones assisting uh, are stepping in and trying to 
get appointed on an emergency basis without even notifying those people. So for a first time, we have a statute that basically says um, that the judge, if they do an appointment on an emergency basis without notice to the person of a professional, um, they have to appoint a court visitor and the visitor has to go and report back to the court um, within 14 days on whether there are uh, members of a supported community for this person and who they are and whether they might be relied on for supported decision making and try to give the judge some idea if this is that type of is done the judge is required within seven days thereafter to issue an order on whether those members of a supported community um, should be entitled to participate in the um, proceeding. Um, you know, my experience is that um, people who are uh, quote unquote interested persons under the statute who are non family members are often uh, given permission from the court to participate in proceedings um, in any event. Uh, and then it's not just limited to the adult children. Um, so I've had cases with other relatives, such as a grandparent wanting to participate in a guardianship for a minor, um, other relatives, uh, cousins, aunts, uncles, um, and friends. Um, but it can take a motion from the person to the court. They might not how, know how to do that. Um, they might just appear at the hearing and the judge might permit them to speak. But this is trying to put in some formal way. Um, and also this is uh, evolving out of some situations in which it's felt that people are having professionals appointed for their affairs just because they're isolated from their family and not because they might um, really need uh, an emergency guardian or conservator. So we'll see how this statute goes. This is something uh, really new. It's already been signed by the governor. So um, we'll see how the courts use it and how it plays out. Um, I did re uh, receive a question about emergency proceedings. Um, and whether, so, ah, okay. I have not had this particular situation myself. Um, this is about whether someone could use an emergency proceeding if the circumstances of the emergency might regard them losing a spot on a Medicaid waiver wait list. And um, let's see if this, this is right. Uh, Brett, did you want to? respond to this? Um, no. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I think I you know far more. Red is going to answer this question. Oh, no, so. I just clicked that it was being answered so that when you are oh, okay. answering the... Oh, okay. Cool. Thank you. So, um, oh, I see. Okay. Well, I can answer this. I, you know, I honestly say I have not um, seen this circumstance, um, a Medicaid waiver list. Um, you know, I have seen situations in which people have been denied an emergency that I thought was an emergency regarding um, their placement coming out of a hospital um, where they needed someone to help them uh, make a placement to a senior, uh, to a skilled nursing facility or a memory care, and they had no one to assist with that and the judge just felt that was not an emergency and that somehow all of the providers would have to make do until there was a regular hearing. Um, so I don't know, you know the answer to that one. I would think if um, there was a waiver, you know, wait list and you could make the case that um, some of the waiver programs in Colorado, so for example, our um, home and community-based services programs are Medicaid waiver programs. Um, so some of them do have wait lists. And if there was 
if you know a person was uh, expected, given the opportunity to be uh, get a service, and they were on a long wait list, and they could lose their um, their shot at it, I would think you could make a decent case to get in um, and see a judge and try to get an appointment. Um, but like I said, I haven't seen that one, so it would be a case by case basis. Um, okay, I've got another question um, from someone who's talking about um, a permanent uh, determination of incapacity. Um, and this this is interesting because it brings up a little bit of the overlap between um, uh, men, uh, mental health uh, laws and um, the probate law, which is these are guardianship and conservatorship are referred to as protective proceedings, and they are under the Colorado Probate Code. So they are part of the probate process. Um, so this is actually different than the um, mental health statutes. They are a different process um, and they, they are handled also by district courts, but they are a different kind of hearing with different participants. Um, we do see overlaps um, and sometimes it is hard to tell even whether the person has a mental health issue, but they would not be found incapacitated for purposes of a guardian or a conservator. Um, sometimes, uh, for example, I did have a person, thinking of a case I had where a person had been um, removed from the community several times and placed on mental health holds um, by a physician, by a psychologist, um, or by the police can place someone on a mental health hold. So the initial hold is a, typically a 48 hours hold. That hold can be extended um, and can be uh, for a longer period uh, after proceeding before a court. Uh, um, however, the fact that someone is placed on a mental health hold, even if it's a longer hold, is not determinative that the person has lost capacity for healthcare decision making and uh, cannot make decisions. Um, neither is the fact that a person is homeless. A lot of you know the homeless have mental health issues. Um, they may be um, placed on a hold when it's determined they are uh, a danger to their own uh, health and safety or those of others. But again, that's not determinative that they've lost capacity for guardianship. Um, I have had a couple cases where homeless people have been appointed guardians. And unfortunately, the mental health issues are uh, overwhelming to the point where the guardian is unable to get any cooperation. And the guardian really isn't able to help the person. Um, so. Uh, there is quite a bit of overlap there, and it can be very difficult um, to determine what's appropriate. I have had guardianships for um, parents of adults, um, particularly young adults, who have uh, mental health breaks, often schizophrenic breaks in their 20s, um, late teens or 20s, um, where the person, the mentally ill person will not sign a release. And so the parents are shut out of even the mental health process unless they can have a guardianship. And so sometimes we're able to get a guardianship and show a lack of decision-making capacity. And the main role of the guardian is to participate in the mental health treatment and the mental health process. Um, so that's an ongoing area. Um, okay, so I have a, um, another question. And uh, I just mentioned, um, you know, 
lawyers generally are not permitted to give advice about specific cases unless we're engaged as an attorney in that case and we have someone that we represent. Um, and this question is a little more specific. Um, this is a kind of um, question raising issues about actions of a trustee for someone and transfers of assets. And again, I don't know this specific case. Um, we do have lots of cases where a fiduciary, whether it's a trustee or an agent under power of attorney, may act improperly. Sometimes, uh, oh, and we're getting to the end of our time. Um, more typically, that is a, um, a financial fiduciary, and it's good to consult with an attorney and see whether a uh, an action can be brought to stop that or a conservator can be appointed who would work for that person. And we've already talked about some of the issues regarding an in-person hearing, an online hearing. You've seen some of these issues. Um, sometimes judges struggle with the technology. They can't hear people. They can't see people. Sometimes parties can't connect. Um, you can phone in to a hearing, even if your computer doesn't work or you don't have a computer. Sometimes the internet connection freezes, people are frozen in the middle of their speaking. And so everyone has to be patient during those uh, hearings. That's my uh, experience. Also, people will try to talk at once. The judges do have control over muting people. Sometimes people will try to talk to a witness in the background. Usually the judge can hear that or see it and will tell them to stop. Here's a quick example of a WebEx hearing notice. You can see it contains code information and a link so people can uh, access the online hearing. Um, here's a quick video that just shows you what it looks like if you're a participant in a hearing. Um, I'm guessing the person with the most books up in the right-hand corner is the judge, but I don't know for sure. Um, okay. Uh, so just so you know, in guardianship and conservatorships, a lot of courts will call multiple cases at the same time, and you just have to wait your turn. So you might see all these people on the Zoom, and it can be very distracting, and you have to just pay attention to the people who are on your case. Um, you can mute your own video. So if another case is going on, you can mute your video and audio, and the judge, of course, can mute people. Um, there is, I found some difficulty if that a, a lawyer and their client are in two different places and they're on video, they can't talk to each other privately. So you, as the lawyer or the client, would have to call on the phone and try to talk to the person and both mute your, yourselves so that other people don't hear you. So overall, my experience has been the courts have adapted in Colorado to COVID and try to achieve both safety and fair process but that everybody has to be patient and realize that there are gonna be delays and complexities in the hearings during as long as this COVID um, remains uh, with us. And that you've, if you want to do a proceeding, you should try and be prepared to use technology. So that's the end of our talk. I would uh, thank everyone for participating today. I hope the whole Senior Law Day series is of benefit to you. And someone once told me a long time ago that if you go to a conference or a seminar, try to always take away at least one thing that is helpful to you or your family and to act on it. So I would encourage everyone to do that. And uh, as I said, my name is Brandon Fields. Um, here's my address and my email. Um, if, ever, if anyone would like to get a copy of the slides from today, feel free to email me and I'd be happy to email those to you. And thank you, everyone. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm just going to put our slide back up with all of our sponsors, but thank you particularly to Brandon. This was wonderful and incredibly informative. I know I learned a lot myself. Um, you mentioned a few times fiduciary duties in, in your talk and 
just yep. a reminder of how intertwined everything is. Um, we have Ann Jorgensen's talk on Tuesday on fiduciary duties. Um, so that's a wonderful, wonderful tie-in. Um, I think the issue of Medicaid came up in long-term care. Thursday, John Estes of CAPSAC Law is going to be talking about uh, Medicaid long-term care coming up. Um, and then you also mentioned financial scams and schemes. And last Thursday, Liz Parker of the DA's office talked about scams and frauds that are out there. So really these are all interconnected and I highly encourage people um, who had um, additional questions pop up, uh, come, come, come get the full, full global view because these issues are, are tied together and you see it crop up in a few different topics. So thank you very much. Thank you.